Hello everyone. In this tutorial, I am going to showcase how to create bump maps to be added to your textures within Maya. This is a way to create detail, the, the sensation of detail geometry without actually changing the geometry, without actually modifying the geometry. Uh, I am going to use the exact same example that we did in class, except I am going to, I just did a new search on the web for a new brick wall tile and it turns out that there's a lot of these images out in the on the web so you can just go ahead and find one and download so i'm going i'm going to start this by going to my poly modeling shelf and i am going to create me a polygon cube now i'm going to click and drag on the grid and i am going to place this somewhat in the middle I am now going to go to my channels box and I am going to change the dimensions for this box from whatever they are to 10 by 10 by 10 and they don't have to be 10 by 10 by 10 but that's just a number that we worked with in class. Uh, keep in mind that as I said in class the measurement of units in Maya is in centimeters so if you want to go by exact numbers then you would have to translate that into inches uh, in order to match what you're trying to do for your models. That said, I'm going to change the subdivisions to one by one by one since each one of these panels or each one of these uh, faces is going to be treated as a wall. And then I'm going to right click to access face mode. I'm going to select this face and I'm going to hit delete. That basically allows me to create an, a room that I can actually texturize. I'm, I'm going to pull, put half a wall of brick at the bottom of these walls. So with that said, you'll notice that the inside of the box is black and that is because my faces are only activated for one-sided lighting. If I go to my object mode, you'll notice that if I rotate, everything is lit, but the inside is dark. So if I want to light up the inside, I need to do one of two things. I need to go ahead and activate two-sided lighting by going under lighting, two-sided lighting. And as I explained, this increases the rendering time or I can go ahead and reverse my normals within my model. And to do that, I'll go under Mesh Display, Reverse. And doing that reverses the normals so that I am actually looking on the inside. And that is ultimately my goal for this piece. If I were to place my camera at some point, it would probably, it would probably play, be placed around here so that I can see the detail of the inside of the box. So with that done, then what I'm going to do next is I'm going to select the box and then I am going to open up my UV editor. So you'll find that under the UV drop down UV editor. Please remember that to see the UV drop down you need to be under the modeling drop down over here. If I change that to rigging you'll notice that UVs are gone or if I change it to any other. So for this I need to be under the modeling drop down on the left hand side access UV menu and then click UV editor. This will open up these two boxes, the UV Editor and the UV Toolkit. I'm going to drag the UV Toolkit and snap it to the right hand side of this so that they move as a unit. And you'll notice that by default, I do have some type of UV map that has been given to me by default by the program. Each one of these UV shells belongs to each one of the faces that I have in here or each one of the polygons that I have in my box. So if I go to Face, in the actual viewport, you'll notice that, I, that as I roll over, it showcases which one of those faces belongs to which one of these UVs. Now by default, UVs, the default UVs are usually not very helpful. So what we did in class is we assign new UVs to each one of these panels. And to do that, we have to create the UVs. So in order to do so, I am going to take two things into account. The first thing is, which is the perpendicular access to the UV that I am trying to uh, create a UV for, sorry, the uh, perpendicular to the plane that I'm trying to create a UV for, perpendicular to the polygon. And uh, second, where is it over here? Where does it land over here? So let me roll over this one on the right hand side of our box. And you'll notice that that is the UV that I will be affecting. So if I select that uh, face, I can now go into my UV toolkit and go under create. Now, like I said a second ago, what I want to know is which is the perpendicular face to that particular UV, I mean to that particular uh, face. And if you notice that Z axis, the blue axis 
our z-axis is the one that is perpendicular to it. So I will be using that to project my UV map, my UV shell onto that particular face. To do so, I'll simply go to my UV toolkit. I'll press shift on my keyboard and then I'll click on planar. 99% of the things that I um, that I texturize, that I use uh, UVs for, I, u I use planar to uh, create ma my mapping. There's other options in here, as you can see, but usually planar is the one that get, yields the best results. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to press shift and click on planar, and that will open up my options box for how I want to create those UVs. You'll notice that by default is set to Y axis. Even if I reset the settings, it's always going to, it's going to go now to the X axis. So now what I want to do is I want to make sure that I am projecting, like I said, from the Z axis, because that's perpendicular to my plane, to my uh, face. So I'll select Z axis and then I'll click apply. You'll notice that I end up with a big box that has some kind of checkerboard pattern in it. And you'll notice in the model itself that I have some kind of gizmo that is surrounding that face. That is my UV map. So now I'll just simply drag from the arrow to move it to the, to the left so that I get it out of the way. I am going to turn off this pattern by clicking here, up here. And this, by the way, is the way you would reveal uh, an image if you had already mapped an image onto this particular box. Since we haven't mapped anything, then it's just showing you a default checker board pattern. So I'll turn it off by clicking on this little icon up here. And you'll notice that my my face has disappeared. My UV, my default UV face has disappeared from the, from the original layout. So that's telling me that I'm heading in the right direction. I actually did apply a different UV, which is what I have on this side. Let me select the back panel and then I'm going to project another UV onto that. And for this one, you'll see that the perpendicular is the X axis. If you notice, when I if I were to switch my tool to the W tool, you'll notice that this X axis, the red axis is the one that is perpendicular to it. So with that said, I am going to use, since I have the options box open, you'll notice that I didn't click project, I clicked apply, it will remain open. So making my life a bit easier. What I'll do now is go ahead and switch my axis to the X axis and click apply. And now that back wall has a UV of its own. Let me move it to the right hand side and put it right here. Then I'll select the wall on the left and that would be projected on the Z axis. So I'll hit apply, move that out of the way. Then I'll select the bottom, the floor, and the floor will be projected on the Y axis. So I'll apply and then I'll move that out of the way. And as a matter of fact, I'm going, as a matter of fact, I am going to move this. Let me select it and move it this way. And then I'll select the last one, which is the ceiling. And I'm going to project on the Y axis. I'll click apply and there it is. So now I'm going to go ahead and grab these two, the ceiling and the floor UVs, and I am going to shrink them in size. These, by the way, this panel, the UV editor responds the same way as your regular viewports. So the W E R keys will call your move, rotate and scale, um, accordingly. So if I press the R key, the scale tool comes up and then I can use the center item to scale down. Now you'll ask yourselves, why do I only see Y and X on this? I don't see a Z. And remember, I explained in class that UVs match your X and Y. So you're trying to utilize this area, this UV area as a 2D projection to map onto 3D objects. And that's why you see uh, only X and Y on the UV editor. Next, I'm going to drag a selection to select all of the other UVs. And then I am going to select these as well. The goal for us when we're using the UV editor is to place our maps within the zero to one and zero to one on both the U and V axes so that we have everything that we're going to be mapping the image within this area. Now, there are some programs that allow you to do multiple tiling UVs, such as uh, Mudbox and uh, Substance to an, to an extent. There are some uh, programs out there that allow you to do this. And that is something that w you should take advantage of in order to increase the quality of your maps. So if you're looking at using 4K mapping or things like that, then you would be looking into multi-tile mapping and uh, what, which software packages do uh, support this. 
For now, we're just going to use the 0 to 1. For our class purposes, we're only going to use the 0 to 1 area, which constrains us to this UV area, to this tile. However, you know, this UV tile is whatever size you want to make it. So when we export our UV guides from this particular window, when we send them to Photoshop to create the guides that we're going to be using, uh, you can make them make them as big as you want. The image, as long as the image ratio is one to one, you can always resize the image to fit within this area. And it will fit, as long as it's one to one, it will fit within this area. So if you make it 4K or 2K or 1000 by 1000 or 500 by 500, it's always gonna match the ratio size of one to one, so it's gonna fit within that tile. So that said, I am going to drag all of these uh, UVs that I've created. I don't need this window open anymore, so I'll close it. And I am going to scroll down in my UV toolkit to arrange and layout. The goal is to place all of these UVs inside this area. And to do so, what I'm going to do is click on layout. Now the program is gonna resize things accordingly to maintain the ratio that I had created for those UVs. Now, I didn't pay attention to the ceiling and the floor because I am not texturing those, so I'm not worried about that. The only things I am really worried about is the walls. This is my back wall, this is my left wall, and this is my right wall. The program will place these items uh, at its own liking. So there's really never, an, if I were to move these out and try to rearrange again in layout, I would probably get a completely different setup. So the program will do that on its own. But fortunately for you, you have a lot of guides. And yes, you can see the guides are pretty much telling you that you are uh, maxing out that area on the one-to-one -one, uh, tile. So what I'm going to do is I'm going, I'm more, I'm concerned with the back wall and the right wall, which are these and this tile. So I'm going to move this guy out of the way. I am going to move the back tile here, and I'm going to move the left, the right tile to this corner using the arrows to snap and to basically align as good as well as I can without going past the one point and without having too much of an overlap between the two walls. That done, I am going to select the other tile, which I'm really not that concerned about in position, and I'll just place it here. So you have pretty good guides and you can always go come back and change the position of these of this UV shelves, by the way. So it's not like once you set them up, they're gonna live there. You can always move them around. As a matter of fact, you can actually change the shape of the tiles and this comes very handy when you have very detailed shelves. So besides you having access to the actual UV shell by right clicking UV shell, you also have access to vertices and to UVs. So if you click on a UV, you'll notice that you have corner points, whatever your um, your uh, faces, uh, your polygons actually have a point and you can actually deform those to match your mapping better if that is what you're looking to do. So let me undo that really quick. Let me move this up and I think I am happy with, with the way this turned out right now. Let me go back to UV shell, make sure that there's not a lot of overlap. I think we're okay. So this is my right panel, this is my back panel, and those are the only two that I'm worrying about texturing right now. To do that, what I want to do is I want to select whatever panels, whatever faces, I want to, whatever UVs I want to export as a guide. And in this case, I'm just simply gonna select everything just to, out, to output. It really does not increase or decrease the size of your final file, so you can just go ahead and, and, and select everything in this particular case. And then you'll notice that there's a little camera icon up here. Now when you click on that, it's gonna ask you, okay, you selected something, what do you wanna save it as? And it will give you the opportunity to save it. Usually I just save my maps onto the source images folder within my project, and that's, but that's just me. You can save them whatever you want, as long as you know where you save them. And I am going to change the name. This time I call it brick OUV, that's what I had before. So I'm gonna call it brick underscore one OUV. OUV stands for, uh, you know, output UVs. And that's just a naming convention. It doesn't change the nature of the file, whatever you wanna name it. You'll notice here that you have access to sizing that map that you're sending out. So if you wanna change this from, this is in this case is a 2K file, which is fairly large. And that works really well for me. And then uh, you have access to choosing a different file format. In my case, I choose TIFF usually, and the reason for that is because I, in some instances, I do want to export an alpha channel with what I'm exporting. That is a very important point. 
if you export this with an alpha channel, it might be something you need to turn off when bringing the file back into Maya because if you maintain the alpha channel, the alpha information might distort the way the map is being read. So if you put uh, an item with an alpha channel, let's say in the color channel or in your um, whatever you what when you are actually adding um, the material to the material, color to the material, it might pick up on that uh, alpha channel and you might end up with not seeing anything because the alpha channel is basically all you would be able to see. And if your alpha channel is calling for transparency, then you won't see anything. I'll show you where to uh, delete that within uh, Photoshop in just a second. So with this done, then I'm going to leave the defaults as they are. I just simply change the name and then I'm going to click apply and close. That has created the file, whatever I pointed, which was my source images folder. With that done, then I'm going to go to Photoshop. And I am going to open up that file. It was called Brick 01 OUV, which is right here. So if I click on that and open it, you'll notice that the file basically brought in the outlines that we had created. But you also notice that under channels, I do have an alpha channel. This is what might create disruption for you. If it is, go to your channels tab and then simply delete that alpha channel. You don't really need it unless you actually intend to use it. And in that case, you'll know what to do with it. So with this as our guide, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open that file that I found on the web. And uh, it is this one breaks two. You'll notice that I was when I did the search for this, what I looked was for a file that was look at the size 1024 by 1024. Remember when we exported this tile brick, this UV tile, this UV map, from Maya, I made sure that it was 2048 by 2048. That is basically twice as big as my bricks. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to select this file and I'm going to move it onto this area. You'll notice that the bricks basically pretty much fit every half of this particular map. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to reduce it in size to 50% its height and 50% its width. So I'll press Control T or Apple T on the Mac, and that calls your free transform tool. Then I'm going to make sure that this is linked so that my ratio it is retained. And then I am going to reduce the size from this corner over here. I'm going to use that as my transform uh, pivot point. I'm going to reduce this to about 50%. Actually, I'm going to reduce it to 25%. And what that means is I am going to have to create four versions of this to come across that entire wall. And that gives me a pretty good size for those bricks. So I'll go ahead and double click on it. And it has been basically taken. The value has been taken. Then I'll just go ahead and make a copy of this layer one. You can do that by either going on the drop down and copying the layer if you want to. Or you can just go ahead and drag that layer onto this little page icon under your layers. Now you've made a copy of it. Let me drag that by making sure that I am on the move tool, this tool right here. And then I'm going to select both of those and I'm going to copy them and move those two to the right hand side. And now you'll notice that I am creating the texture of the wall. So with that, I am going to create two iterations of this to create half of the wall. So I'll select all of the layers that I've created make copies of it, make copies of them, drag them. And as you, you'll notice that my layers snap, and that's because I have the default set, settings in Photoshop that allowed me to leverage the guides to help me snap. With all this selected now, and with all this created, I'm going to make a copy of all that and place it as a wall on this side. So in, before I do that, I'll select all of the copies that I created of that original bricks layer, and I'll go ahead and uh, merge the layers that I've selected. Control E is the shortcut. And then with that merge layer, I am going to make a copy and I am going to drag it to the right. And now those, as you can see, the tile is seamless and I have my wall or I have at least the portion of the wall that I want to construct right now that I want to use as a uh, bump map. So this would be what I would call my color map. At this point, I would save this file as a reference. So I would probably go and save file, save as, and then I would save this file as work in progress. So I will say brick color work in progress. Okay. And I would, I could save it as a TIFF, as a Photoshop, whatever file format I want to save. 
right now I just I want to save it as a TIFF file with layers and then I'll click save now that is my I will say no compression and I'll go ahead and click OK it's gonna tell me that's gonna make a larger file that's okay this is my reference file this is not what I'm going to be rendering with that is what I'm about to create next so to create my actual file that I'm going to render with I'm going to flatten this file and so to do that I'll go ahead and go into my drop down menu for my layers in Photoshop and click all the way down to flatten image and now my image becomes one flattened file now with that done I am going to go ahead actually I should remove that map I don't like exporting with the map so I'm going to create a new layer and I am going to fill it with my for my background or foreground color I'll choose what color I want you know depending on what I'm trying to do in this case I'm just going to use black then I'm going to flatten the file and I am going to save that file as my break color remove the WIP portion and I'm going to save it as a TIFF I'm going to say no compression everything else set as is that will be my color map the next thing I want to do is I want to make this into a bump map and to do that keep in mind that anything that is white anything that's white within the within the bump map gets pulled towards the camera Any, anything that is dark or black gets pushed away so in this case if I were to simply desaturate the file I would end up with something that looks like this and you'll notice that my bricks are the dark and the mortar is the light so I would get the reverse effect the white is what get what gets pulled towards the camera the dark is what gets pushed away so what I want to do is I need to find a way of actually reversing this so that my mortar is the dark so to do that what I am going to do is let me not desaturate I am going to leverage the color that I have right now for the brick the red and I am going to select anything that is that color or within that color range and to do that I will go to select color range and you'll notice I had done this before so that's pretty well set up but let me let's say for example if you had something that looked like this and things were not pretty well selected let me find a way of actually trying to reset this uh, so that you see what you would be seeing now if you see if you're lucky as I am and like I said I had done this earlier so you will you won't see you're seeing this in really good detail I mean it's pretty clean uh, what you would do the process to do it would be for you to select the color so you would be seeing instead of grayscale you probably would see the color and you would simply go and select one of the colors now if you see image select that and then you can go ahead and switch that to grayscale now you'll see that you start seeing a lot more gray areas around your bricks and so you want to make sure that you take care of that as you are to, to make sure that your selection is a little bit more thorough it depends truly on what you're trying to do if you're trying to create more texture within the bricks themselves then these grays will push to create a bit more texture within the brick it would like it would make them less flat and that might be what you're looking for but if you're trying to create something that is completely flat then your your goal is to remove all this gray to do that you would pick on your second picker and then select those gray areas and you'll notice that everything that you selected turns wider so you have the option to reduce the fuzziness to get more texture or increase it to get it to fill it out more white if you want if that's what you're trying to do to for it to increase or decrease your selection this is what we're doing right now so I, the, the reason why I'm showing it in grayscale is so that we can see clearly where the white areas are and where the black areas are I'm going to reduce this so that I want to get some texture on the bricks so I'm going to go for that and then I'm going to click OK now you remember that we started by selecting the the red within the brick and that's what is selected the bricks are what is selected right now so what I'm going to do is I'm going to invert that selection because truly what I want to change is the mortar area so to do that I am going to number one since I have the brick selected I can go ahead and fill them with a white color so I'll switch my front color to white and then I'll go edit fill and I can say uh, white click OK boom my bricks have been filled with white then I'll go ahead and invert my selection so I'll go select inverse and then I fill everything else with black okay and that gives me the bump map 
that I need for my uh, the map that I need for my bot map in Maya. So with this done, I'll go ahead and save this file. And I'm going to select save it as brick01 uh, bump. Try to give things a name that actually makes sense to what you're working on. I'll save it as a TIFF. And then I'll click Save. Make sure that there's no compression. Make sure IBM PC is selected in my case. And then everything else stays standard. So I'll click OK. And the file has been saved. Now let's jump back to Maya. And in Maya, I want I, I can go ahead and close my UV box for now. And all I need to do now is go ahead and assign a material to this model. So I'll go ahead and switch to object mode so that I can select it. And to select them to assign a material, we've been working with the Arnold materials. So what I'll do is I'll go ahead and right click. And from the marking menu, I am going to go down all the way to assign new material. When I click on that, a box opens up that is similar to the one we saw in the hypershade. And here I'll select Arnold and I'm going to narrow it even more. I'm going to select shader because that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking to apply F shader. In this case, our standard surface shader, the Arnold standard surface shader is what I'm looking for. So I'll click on that and you'll notice that I get kind of a color, a little light color on the on the model itself. And if I go to my attributes editor for that box and right click all the way to the right hand side, my Lambert one has been replaced by AI standard surface. This shows me a swatch of what the model of the color of my uh, material right now. Let me actually make it brighter so you can see what this looks like. And that is the material that has has been applied to my object. Now, in order to see things in Arnold, as you know, we need to have some type of light. And because this is a box and supposedly it would be kind of like an internal light, an internal um, setting, meaning a room, I prefer to keep lights that are um, that are meant to be internal. So things such as a point light or spotlight would be what work best within this area. Um, area lights or um, lights that are area lights also work well, uh, but try not to use for internal lighting. Try not to use your um, this light, the sky dome light, because that light is you is really good for environment. So that means you're outside and you're probably going to use an HDRI image to light your scene. So with this said, then I'm going to go to my rendering shelf and I'm going to select the spot uh, point light, sorry. And I'm going to bring it up to the middle of the room so that it lights up. I can go ahead and change my shading in the viewport to hardware texturing so that I can see what I'm doing as I add things into it. And then I can use all lights by going under the lighting drop down in my viewport and you notice that the shortcut for that is seven. So you'll notice now that I'm seeing the reflection of my light, meaning my material is very reflective in the wall, the material that I used. So with that done, let me go ahead and select my model again, go to the actual um, surface, uh, uh, to the actual material. And I am going to scroll down to my geometry, which is where I have the uh, mapping capabilities for the for this type of model in some other in some other shaders like uh, Blin or the other ones that we saw in class the butt material resides with right below the specular so uh, remember that for the uh, Arnold materials they uh, the bump mapping is within the geometry so what I'm going to do now is I am going to go to the bump mapping map button and then from the node creator that comes up, I am going to select file. And now I'm going to, it, it applies the actual node, same bump map to the, where I actually have access to um, how deep or how shallow I want this bump map to be. I also have the ability to change the type of bump map. And we will see this in next class when we start working with normal maps. But more important is I can now see that the bump value, value the bump value is defined by a map and that map resides inside this thing. You'll notice that this icon and these icons look very similar. The one that has the arrow pointing towards the center of the box is the one that tells you you are going one level down. Think of nodes. Remember when we saw the nodes in the hypershade, they're basically hierarchical. So they're connected and you can go down a chain of hierarchies uh, as you are building these different materials. In this case, we have a material that is our AI standard surface material. 
in that to that material we applied a bump to the um, node and then to that bump to the node we're going to attach an image so that's basically the hierarchy or the network that we've created for this specific material so to access it I need to go down to that level so I'll click on that icon and now you'll notice that I get to the file area which is where I load my material where I load my map so I'll go ahead and go to where's this image name that little folder and then I'm going to go it opens up my source images because my scene is connected to that particular uh, project and I will look for bump 01 file that tiff then I'll click open and you'll notice that it automatically shows as a bump map in my object on my object sorry so with that done two things to keep in mind when we're working with this this is something we didn't cover in class and I will remind you next class next time we meet for color space sRGB is the default but you have a, a whole lot of other options in here I find myself lately more often than not say uh, changing my sRGB to raw and the reason for that is because the raw actually gives me better results with the bump mapping textures that I create in Photoshop than the sRGB. sRGB relies heavily on the actual color environment of the image. Something if you have taken any print classes that would make a lot of sense. If you haven't then uh, something to investigate what sRGB means. But RAW it actually uses the, the, the actual setup of the image the way I see it. So there's really no influence other than the image itself. And that's why I prefer to use RAW. Uh, that done let me close this box really quick and then if I want to get out of this and I want to increase or decrease the bump amount I can go ahead and click on the one that's the uh, with the arrow pointing outward so I'll click on that and now I find myself back on the bump to the node the one that controls the actual bump mapping and you'll notice that I have a bump map depth of one depth of one so if I select that and I change it to let's say 0.2 hit return you'll notice that by my bump mapping gets shallower if I go zero it disappears I can also go negative so if I go negative one you'll notice that I am reversing where the shadows are within this bump map so I have the ability to push or pull the bump map depending on what I'm trying to do usually with my bump maps I stay between zero and one unless I truly want to make sure that my texture is really heavily influenced by the bump map itself which seldom happens if I'm heading in that direction I usually don't use a bump map I will use a normal map so with this set I am going to change this to point three and that gives me a pretty good texture of what the bricks are supposed to look like sticking out you'll notice as well that if I let me minimize this box if I go to my scene and I select the light which I see here or I can select it in my outliner if I move it you'll notice that the shadows respond to the position of the light so this is where I was this is what I was talking about in class if you you are basically creating fake geometry at a distance this looks like it has been modeled and the bumps look like actual 3d space has been created from that particular wall but if I go close up to them you'll notice that this is completely flat so you are creating fake 3d geometry just on the rendering portion of the model to, uh, to fake and that saves you a lot of rendering time basically creating something like this saves you a lot of you try to imagine trying to create this texture by actually modeling it now in some instances you might have to do something this detailed but for most for most of the of the uses for models that we do we will find that this will work just fine using bump maps actually add a lot of detail without the geometry and save you a lot of time on rendering so with that done let me go to Arnold really quick go to Arnold render view and run an IPR by clicking on the either the play button hitting the space bar or clicking on the render run IPR those are the three ways to actually create what uh, a render a quick render of what you're looking at you'll notice that in the actual rendering environment my light is very dim and that's because of the intensity of the light is only 0.1 I mean it's only one sorry so I can go ahead and go to 50 on that light and you'll notice that my light goes up fairly significantly so I have ways to control that let me go to 25 
and you'll notice that my bump mapping is rendering and it's responding. Now, one of you guys, I can't remember who it was, mentioned that you were able to see in the past your maps in the UV editor, and you still can. Let me go ahead and close my Arnold rendering window and open up my UV editor. You'll notice that I don't see anything here when I select my object. I see the UV maps, but I'm not showing anything that has been mapped onto them. You have the ability to showcase the map by clicking on this button. Remember, whereas before this was showing us a checkerboard pattern, now it's actually showing the uh, map itself that we have created for this specific model. It is at this time where you still start using UV maps to find detail what you're trying to, how you're trying to uh, project those maps onto your object. And what that means is, if I select the shell for this, let me right click and use, instead of shell, I used UVs. Let me select the UV point for this particular shell right here. And let me shift click this UV right here. And when I move this down, you'll notice that my maps will be changing in my viewport. You'll see how I got deformed. Let me select this one right here, bring it down, and you'll notice that my mapping is basically changing depending on what I have selected. So if I select that and then I select this, whoops, way too many UVs intersecting at the same point. There you go. I can go ahead and modify how the map is projected onto the actual shelf. So when you create your final projects or when you're working on any project and you want to fine-tune the shelves then you would use these UV points to stretch or contract the map according to what you're trying to create and so that it fits your model better that way you end up you, you can go ahead and get as finely detailed as possible within your models so that your mapping looks as good as you can make it or as you intend to make it okay so I hope this showcases what bump mapping is, how to control it, and how to create it within Photoshop. Keep in mind that the key is using light and dark values for the bump mapping, where light or white is what's coming towards the camera and dark or black is what's pushing away. Everything else is in between. Uh, and if you if you notice, the the gray areas within your map actually some are, there's something you can leverage to create semi um, let me bring this back down to one so we can see this. Semi indented areas within the brick. Okay, so gray areas will give you a bit of indentation, not as much as the black areas. Now, if this is too sharp, if the bricks are looking too sharp, you can always go back and modify your map. You can always make it go back to your go back to your um to your uh, Photoshop file and apply a Gaussian um uh, um, um, what's the word? File, filter, blur. So if you go to blur, you can apply Gaussian blur and then increase little by little until you get a bit of fuzziness around the edges of your bricks. And that should work to make your bump map a little bit less sharp in the Maya environment.